My name is Mary Dundon. I'm the Head of Journalism at the University of Limerick. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here to Ballybunning this morning. Um, I'm chairing the political symposium today, which is going to debate probably one of the most pressing issues in the country today, which is the escalating housing crisis and what the government needs to do to solve it. Um, I suppose we all agree there's no denying the depth of the crisis and the challenges that it poses uh, to providing homes for everyone in Ireland. I'm delighted to welcome here this morning a very expert panel to debate the topic, um, Housing Minister Damien English, who is responsible for the issue, long-time campaigner for the rights of the homeless, Father Peter McVerry, Labour's Housing and Urban Renewal spokeswoman, Deputy Jan O'Sullivan, who was also a former Minister for State with responsibility for housing and planning, and the Sunday Times award-winning journalist and commentator, Justine McCarthy. Please give them all a warm welcome. panellist is going to speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll open the topic to the floor for a questions and answer session. But before we start, uh, just to put the current housing crisis into context, I'd like to quote you an article that the Irish Times journalist, the late Mary Cummins, who hailed from Ballybunion, wrote back in 1970. It was about the substandard housing of Riverbrand House in Monkstown, County Dublin, that was subdivided into 13 flats and was home to 20 adults and 19 children. She wrote at the time, Rembrandt House has become a scene of a bureaucratic battle over the past couple of years, and the latest stage has resulted in the electricity being cut off for the past couple of weeks. Uh, these tenants were victims of a bureaucratic confusion when the owner of the house left Ireland in 1967, and the rents were subsequently collected by the Educational Building Society who subsequently served an eviction notice on the tenants. They refused to move and the rent collection stalled. Then the EFB refused to let the tenants take over responsibility for the account, so they had no electricity. These tenants had no security of tenure or control over their rents. And these are the very same challenges that thousands of tenants in Ireland's private rental market are facing today, almost 50 years later. We also know that this has led to a number of homeless people in Ireland now almost topping 15,000. We know that there are over 72,000 households on social housing waiting lists nationally, which is really closer to a quarter of a million people. And next month, uh, the housing campaigners are hoping to bring thousands of people onto the streets of Dublin for a national demonstration to protest at the deepening crisis. Uh, the Raise the Roof um, campaign group, which is really a coalition of unions, civil society organisers and political parties, saw 10,000 people on the streets in Dublin last uh, October uh, uh, protesting about the housing crisis. And yesterday, Father Peter McVerry announced that they're going to hold another protest on Saturday the 18th of May um, to put focus on the housing crisis. It's what he calls a catastrophe and he claims that the governments are only tweaking at policies to try to solve the problem. So today we're going to focus on what can be done to try to tackle this housing emergency, and more importantly, what concrete and realistic measures can be taken. So um, our first speaker this morning is going to be Father Peter McVerry. He'll be followed by um, uh, Justine McCarthy from the Irish Sunday Times, and uh, Jan O'Sullivan from the Labour Party, and finally, the minister is going to give his response to the points they've made. So I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Father. Good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time you get up at. Uh, I remember about seven, eight, seven years ago or so, I was talking in Bray. Jan was there, I don't know if you remember. But I talked about a tsunami of homelessness coming down the road, and the figure I quoted was 5,000 people. Today, officially, we have over 10,000, but unofficially, it's 15,000 at least. The official figures don't count uh, people living in tents, people living in cars, uh, people who are sofa surfing. They don't count women uh, fleeing violence in domestic refuges. Don't count about 700 refugees who have been given refugee status but can't move out of direct provision because they can't find anywhere uh, to live. So my own guesstimate is there's about 15,000 people who are homeless. But apart from that, homelessness is only the most visible 
and extreme consequence of a dysfunctional housing system. I would guesstimate, at a conservative estimate, that there are half a million people in this country whose housing situation is causing them serious distress. Not just those who are homeless, those who are living in overcrowded households, those who are living in very poor quality private rented accommodation but can't complain because they're afraid they'll be evicted, those living in good quality uh, private rented accommodation but worried sick when the rents are going to go to a level which they can no longer afford. Recent survey showed that 5% of those renting are paying 70% of their income to the landlord just to keep a roof over their head. Uh, and then there are those in mortgage arrears, and I'll come to that in a minute. So we have a massive, massive problem, and uh, <clears throat> so uh, how do we get here? Well, in 1975, this country built 8,900 council houses. In 1985, this country built 6,900 council houses. In 2015, this country built 75 council houses. Now in 2016, there was a huge jump to 264 council houses. 2017, there was a jump up to about 2,000 council houses. But we're in this situation because the government abdicated its response. Successive governments, not just uh, Fianna Gael, uh, successive governments abdic abdicated their responsibility to provide housing for low-income families and tried to pass that responsibility on to the private sector. The private sector is not interested in providing accommodation for low-income houses. The private sector is in the business of making a profit. And rightly so, that's what they do. Uh, so passing that on to the... <coughs> passing responsibility for housing low-income people to the private rented sector has been a dismal failure. The, uh, the demand on the private rented sector uh, far outstrips supply. If certainly in Dublin, I don't know what it's like in Tralee or... But certainly in Dublin, if somebody goes to look at a house or an apartment to rent, there'll be 40 people outside que queuing up to view that apartment. So it has been a failed policy, but it continues to be government policy. According to Rebuilding Ireland, 75% of those on the social housing waiting list and those who are homeless are to be housed in the private rented sector. The, uh, <clears throat> so... We got here because of a failure to provide council houses. We have got to go back to providing thousands of, back to building thousands of council houses if we're going to get out of this crisis. We've got to see investment in council housing as just as important as investment in broadband, our investment in transport, our investment in motorways. Investment in council housing is the only solution in the medium term to resolving this, uh, this, this housing, housing crisis. Where are we going? Uh, we're heading, as I have said several times, into a catastrophe. There are 40,000 mortgages in arrears of more than two years. 28,000 are owner-occupied, 12,000 are landlords who have fallen into serious debt and cannot pay the mortgage. The central bank estimates that at least half of those are going to be repossessed and that the occupants evicted. If that were to happen, and if even a percentage of those who get evicted become homeless, this country will not be able to cope. We will have families stay living in guard stations. We will have families spending the, the, their days on, in parks and on the street. We simply will not, unless we address this mortgage arrears crisis, we are, uh, we are going nowhere. There are two problems. How do we house those who are currently on the waiting list and those who are currently homeless? Well, the first aspect of that, as I say, is we got to go back to building council houses. The state, with its STEMI state bodies, own enough land to build 140,000 houses. And the state owns the land. We don't have to buy it. And we've got to go back to that. What is happening is what land, they, 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 what land is owned by the state is being sold to private developers to build private housing and to return to the state 20 or 30 percent council houses. To my mind, that is a massive transfer of wealth from the state to the private sector. 
private uh, public land should be used for public housing. Full stop. No selling it. Uh, <clears throat> The government are keen, and I, I appreciate their position, to build integrated housing, not just to have massive big housing estates, social housing estates, but we can build integrated housing. We can build social housing. We can build affordable housing. Because there is this group in the middle who really are not talked about very much, but who are feeling the brunt. It's people whose income is too low to be able to qualify for a mortgage, but too high to qualify for social housing. They're stuck in the private rental sector. And no matter what happens, if the rent goes through the roof, there's nothing they can do about it. They are stuck there. Uh, and so we've got to, uh, there was a saying, uh, yeah, we've got to build, the state can build a social housing, it can build affordable housing on the same site. And affordable housing is for people who are working, but their income is too low to get a mortgage. They can build affordable student accommodation. Because what student accommodation has been built today is out of reach of, of most students. They can build old folks accommodation and that might free up some houses where old people would prefer to move into a small, uh, supervised, self-contained new place and free up maybe a three or four bedroom house. We can build social integrated housing uh, on the land that the state owns. But the idea of selling that to the, to the private sector, to my mind, is, 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 is a total waste. Second aspect is everywhere you go, sure Tralee and Tremor and everywhere else is the same, there are thousands of empty buildings. Thousands of empty houses boarded up. Not talking about holiday homes, not talking about second homes. Empty, permanently empty, boarded up houses. The census in 2016 identified 186,000 empty, boarded up houses. Now many of them have been brought back into use, many of them are not suitable, many of them are tied up in legal. Uh, uh, disputes, many of them are part of the fair deal scheme, not available, but there are tens of thousands of empty buildings that we should be bringing back. It's obscene to have an empty house in the middle of a housing crisis. And although the government has given a grant, offered a grant to the homeowners to bring those back into use, very few homeowners have taken up that grant. We would be arguing, if you don't use it, you lose it. Compulsory purchase orders. Uh, on those buildings that, uh, that uh, the owners are unwilling or unable to bring back into use. So I think between those two, building social ho council housing <coughs> and using the empty homes, <coughs> we could make huge inroads very quickly into uh, the, the housing crisis. The other crisis, which is even more urgent, is preventing more and more people becoming homeless. Because Focus Ireland will say that they can house one family, homeless family, every day, but there's three families presenting as homeless every day. So unless we stop that flow into homelessness, what we're doing trying to house homeless people is like trying to empty the bathwater with the taps full on. We've got to stop that flow. And where is the flow coming from? It's primarily coming from the private rented sector. And it's primarily because landlords are saying we're selling the house. What I would argue is that for three years, just for three years, we have an emergency. It should be illegal to evict people into homelessness, except in special circumstances, like if a tenant is dealing drugs or something, of course, you want to get them out. But in the normal course of event, it should be illegal to evict people into homelessness, just for three years. That will be an inconvenience to some landlords. It's not going to bankrupt anybody. It will be an inconvenience, but the alternative is the trauma of being homeless inflicted on thousands of homeless of families over the next over the next three years. The government have adamantly set their mind against that. My alternative solution then is if a landlord wants to sell the house, they should be obliged to give the local authority first refusal. So they want to sell the house, right? You go to the local authority, it's a win-win for everybody. The landlord sells the house uh, at market value without having to bother with the state agents or anything. Oh, there's no state agents here. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the tenants get to stay in the house, and the local authority gets a new social or affordable house, which is what they're looking for, an increase in the number of social and affordable houses that are available to them. So that's the, uh, that would be my prescription for dealing with this problem. What's the obstacle? One of the biggest obstacles to developing a proper housing and homeless strategy is the Department of Finance. 
The Department of Finance have different priorities. They want to see house prices going up. Because as house prices go up, houses that are in negative equity move into positive equity. And when the bank comes to repossess them and sell them, they get more money and it'll increase their, their capital, uh, capitalization. The uh, <coughs> Department of Finance is in favor of rents continuing to rise. Because as rents continue to rise, Ireland becomes more attractive to the international investment funds who are coming in and buying and building blocks and blocks of, uh, of apartments, uh, which they're going to rent, but they're going to rent at the top end of the market. They're not going to rent at the bottom end of the market. So uh, they are, they, we, we have been asking for years for a levy on empty buildings. Department of Finance don't want a levy. Why? Because the banks own lots of empty buildings that they've repossessed. So the big obstacle, you know, if you have a crisis, if you have an emergency, as we had with the foot and mouth disease a number of years ago, a good few years ago, you call all the departments together and all the relevant bodies together and you work out a plan and everybody pulls in the same direction. That is not happening today in regard to the housing crisis. I see no evidence from this government that the... Uh, uh, that they, they recognize a crisis or an emergency. They say they do, of course. The Taoiseach, about 18 months ago, said we have, a, we have a crisis. What crisis action have we seen in the last 18 months? Nothing. So we have a crisis, we have an emergency, we've got to take emergency action. And emergency action is action that some vested groups won't, won't like. But that's the route that we, that we, 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 we have to go down. So I got over my ten minutes. I better shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Father McFerry. You've given us a lot of food for thought there. Um, our next speaker is Sunday Times journalist uh, Justine McCarthy. Um, I hail from West Cork, but I live in Dunleary in Dublin. And just the mention of empty houses reminded me that at the bus stop where I usually get the 46A bus in to work, there is a very expansive house on a corner. It covers almost half of two roads uh, called York House. You could build comfortably four uh, two-storey semi-detached houses there or you could build maybe 12 apartments. Um, it has been empty since ever before the Celtic Tiger ran out of Ireland. And about three months ago, the councillors voted uh, to put the house on the uh, repossession list, that they were going to take it over and they were going to do it up and they were going to develop housing on that site. But they haven't been able to do anything because the registered owner of that house is an anonymous company in the British Virgin Islands and they haven't yet been able to establish what person is the beneficial owner of that company so that they can, as they're legally obliged, inform them of that decision. And I think that goes to the heart of what's wrong with why we have this homelessness crisis in the first place. Um, I, I'm one of those awful people who were being disparaged in the last uh, session, a political correspondent in Leinster House. And I had the great privilege of sitting on the press gallery and every time the issue of homelessness comes up and the opposition will uh, say to the government, why don't you stop uh, providing tax shelters, tax incentives, grants for developers and landowners and look after the people who need homes? And the government's reply is usually one of three things. One is, well, we're actually doing a great job. It's just that the problem keeps getting worse as if it has nothing to do with them, that the problem keeps getting worse. The second response is the government says, well, we don't have an, any ideology about homelessness. The insinuation being that the other crowd are riddled with ideology. 
And uh, the third reply is that the opposition is being too emotional. In other words, they should be practical and detached. So I'd just like to go through those three defences. Um, I have actually written this down in the wrong order, so bear with me. Uh, the one about it, not, you know, that they're doing a great job, but the problem keeps getting worse. Um, this problem has been visible, at least in the streets of Dublin, since 2011-2012. You could not but notice it as you walked around the city centre. Almost every week you would see a new body huddled in a sleeping bag on a doorstep. And it is deeply distressing. Um, you know, I, I, it's certainly a first word problem when you're saying it's dis distressing for you as a bypasser having to see this, rather than talk about the distress of the people who are actually lying at the doorsteps. But it wasn't until a man called Jonathan Corey died in 2014, um, outside the gates of Leinster House, literally on a doorstep, that suddenly it became a sort of topical issue. And uh, I think, was it Alan Kelly was the minister at the time? Yeah. He said he was rolling his sleeves up and getting to work. Well, you would think rolling your sleeves up and getting to work means rolling your sleeves up and going and building houses. Um, there was a lot of PR around that time, and um, according to the figures that uh, Father Peter has recited, we can see that there was actually very little to it. Um, housing is, it is a very complex matter, and I think it is necessary to make piecemeal reforms, uh, and slowly the government began doing that. Um, but the second point that it makes about that it has no ideology, I think this is just so stark, ravingly untrue. I can't believe that any sensible human being would even say that. Um, the issue of housing is steeped in the ideology of our culture. Um, the Taoiseach has said in the Dáil, for instance, that he believes in home ownership. He believes that the current rate of home ownership in Ireland, which is, stands at around the mid 70s percent, percentage point, um, is not high enough and he wants it to be higher. But he hasn't explained how he is going to do that when developers are being incentivized to build massive developments and then sell them en bloc to foreign vulture funds thus depriving people, particularly young people, of the opportunity to own their own homes. Um, I think it, there's been a couple of very strong examples recently of the ideology that society has and that our politicians have about home ownership. Um, the Metrolink, we saw where residents in Ranala, um, which is what you would call a Tony well-heeled uh, Dublin suburb, managed to have the Metrolink plan to run the Metro out to their village stopped because it was going to cause them inconvenience, the, the word Father Peter also used, because it would require over four years of construction um, traffic detours and uh, maybe changes to the newest schedule. Um, Owen Murphy, the Minister for Housing, was actually involved in making representations on that issue for his constituents. He's a Dublin's the Bay South TD. Meanwhile, in a place called Townsend Street, which is literally a stone's throw from the GPO where the proclamation was written and read. Elderly residents of uh, a small development of city council owned duplexes were told that their homes are going to be demolished to make way for the metro. 
they weren't even given the courtesy of being informed of this by letter by the council. Their local politicians told them about it. There has been no furore about it. It is hardly featured in the media. In the same week that came out, there were stories across all the newspapers and on television about a couple in Sandy Mount, also in the minister's uh, constituency, who live in a house that has been valued at two to three million euro. They operate it as a B and B. It is a beautiful Victorian red brick uh, house. And they went out in the media and they asked people, uh, the public, to support them. They are being uh, evicted from their home, or the, their home is, their banks are a bank trying to repossess that home because the couple took out bank loans of 25 million uh, with the intention of building a hotel or developing a hotel, which never happened. Now, my heart goes out to anybody who is faced with losing their home. But I think the disparity between the coverage and the attention that that couple got and the elderly people whose homes are going to be demolished in Towns End Street is absolutely shocking. And it does speak of the ideology that is deeply ingrained in Irish society, where we see our homes as investments, assets, um, where the more expensive homes and the richer people live in places that have better public transport links, um, where their addresses look well on their CVs and in their job applications, where their neighbours might be able to put in a good word for them um, in seeking jobs, where they literally have more trees growing in their streets. Um, so don't tell me we don't have an ideology about housing. And finally, on the point of emotion. If you're not emotional about homelessness, there's something deeply wrong with you. Um, our homes are our sanctuary. They're where we go for love and shelter and security. Um, they are places that are full of emotion and feeling. And the very idea of being without that refuge is horrific. I think try telling John that homelessness is not about emotion. John was a very handsome young man who started living on the street near the office where I work. Um, I have to say my eye was caught by his good looks rather than the fact that he was sitting on the footpath and I got to know him and he was very vulnerable and he didn't want to go into a homeless hostel because he was not on drugs, he'd never done drugs, and he said the hostels were full of people on drugs and he was not going to go there. And over the months, John's good looks started deteriorating. His eyes grew more vacant. He became less communicative, and I knew he was on drugs. And then he disappeared. Try telling the young couple who used to sleep outside the tiger shop in Nassau Street. She was Scottish, he was Irish. They were deeply in love. All they wanted was a home. They wanted to set up a home together. They wanted to have children. They disappeared too. One after the other, you see the people coming and going. There was a young woman who used to sleep on the footpath outside the old Anglo-Irish Bank headquarters. And one morning, her face was covered in bruises. She said she had been asleep during the night and somebody just came along and kicked her in the face for no reason, a stranger. She was pregnant. She was worried that her baby would never be born alive. She disappeared. I think it is just such an indictment on our government and not just this government, the previous government, all our politicians but on us too, that we haven't shouted loud enough. Mary Robinson says there is a time to be disruptive. And if we can't be disruptive about homelessness, if 
if people don't go out and march and protest and shout, you know, there is no hope for us. But I always think, as a journalist, the most reassuring thing in my career has been knowing that the vast majority of people are good and the vast majority of people care. And we showed that in the last general election, actually. Homelessness was a huge issue on the doorsteps. And I think it will be again this time. Jan O'Sullivan now, the Labour Housing and Urban Renewal spokesperson. Thanks, Jan. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. And um, I, I, I think I might begin where Justine has left off in relation to the very powerful stories that she has described, the actual lives of people. But also I think the role of the media and the role of the public and the role of ourselves as public representatives. And, um, you know, this weekend is dedicated to the memory of Lyra McKee and um, her, the awful tragedy of her death has actually led to politicians, uh, the British government, the Irish government and politicians in Northern Ireland coming together. Now what will come out of it at the end we don't know but I think what that shows is the power of that kind of, uh, of public response and the response in the church uh, and indeed the response to the death of Jonathan Corrie uh, so, you know, it, I think it's the role of the media to tell those stories. It's also partially the role of us as politicians to tell those stories and to think about those stories. And any time I think about homelessness, I think of one particular woman who I've been dealing with who has two children who are in primary school and, the, and they're living in a hotel. And the difficulties those children are having in school. The boy trying to pretend that he doesn't live in a hotel, he's older. The little five-year-old girl who used to be a very quiet little girl who's now been, the mother's been told by her teacher that she's shoving people around and, you know, the, the actual emotional effect on them. So the, the individual stories are so important and I think that's why, again, I want to reiterate the Raise the Roof protest, which is on, on the 18th of, of May, uh, that people should come out. Uh, but that is the, I think, because this is about media this weekend, that is very much the role of the media. I think the role of us as public representatives is partially that as well, but it is also to come up with solutions, to develop solutions, and to talk about those solutions and, and work to have them implemented. Um, but I, I want to, before I talk about the specific proposals that we have in the Labour Party, I just also want to talk about the ethical issue, because I do think ideology is important. I do think there needs to be an ideology behind policy. And certainly, um, I would completely reject the ideology that is about um, competitiveness, about profit. Um, we do need a publicly led, using state land, social and affordable programme of housing, build, housing building uh, and development in this country. And we also need to use the vacant properties that are there. And I do think ideology is, is very much part of it. You need to have that approach, not the approach that Father Peter has just described, where only 30% of the publicly owned land in current policy is to be used for public housing uh, or affordable social housing. I would prefer to call it public housing rather than social housing but, because that covers the, the, those squeezed people who are working, who can't afford to get a mortgage, can't afford to buy a house, can't afford their rent. Um, so we need to have affordable as well as social homes. But that fundamentally is about ideology and it is about the kind of philosophy that you believe in and I actually think that relates to the European elections as well because we've had very much of a right-wing focus in Europe recently. We need to go back to the social Europe, uh, we need to embrace our responsibilities as human beings and I would like to see that as very much part of the themes within the European debate at the moment as well because I do think that's important. And just very briefly, because I don't want to go back to the past, but just very briefly to talk about when I was Junior Minister for Housing, we were still under the Troika. We were still under that, that kind of philosophy. We, had, we were not allowed to build houses. The most useful thing I could do was to set up the void scheme, which has been continued by the current government, which actually has brought a lot of, a, a lot of social houses back into use, but there are still more empty ones. In my own city of Limerick, there are over 100 local authority homes currently vacant, so there's something still wrong with how that is being implemented. There, you know, work has been done. But there are, I absolutely agree, that the vacant homes around the country, whether they're privately owned or publicly owned, have got to be a focus of attention. But 
the, uh, at that time, that, that was what, all we could do. And again, just in, in Alan Kelly's time, because in fairness to him, um, he did announce a, a 4 billion euro programme of public housing at the time. I was only able to announce a very, very small one. It takes, you know, the reality is it does take a number of years to actually get those up and running. And that's one of the things I want to talk about now as well, because I think we need to address that problem. That issue of how long it takes to go from planning uh, public housing to actually delivering it. Uh, and I think there is a fundamental problem with the current system and, and the relationship between uh, the, the, the governance of the Department of Housing and the local authorities. Some local authorities are very proactive, others are not. So part of what we want to propose and what we have proposed in a policy document, and I'm sure nobody really wants to read a full policy document, but this is basically uh, what we have. And I've worked with, um, with people who are on local authorities, uh, people who, uh, who have you know, done a lot of research, uh, and so on, and we've worked out this policy to the best of our ability in terms of what we are proposing for solving the, the problem of, 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 and the awful problem of homelessness uh, and the general difficulty with housing at the moment and the fact that we just do not have a functioning housing system and it should not be a market and it needs to be publicly led and as Father Peter has rightly said, the state already owns enough land to build the number of homes that we need. And we would argue that we need a publicly led, state led programme of building homes. And um, we've, we've actually co we've costed how much it would cost to build 80,000 social and affordable homes over five years. Uh, with, and, and the cost would be 16 billion, and we've identified where that would come from, including um, money that is already there in, in terms of the Infrastructure Development Fund, in terms of the European Investment Bank and the Rainy Day Fund, which is a kind of a notional amount of money, which actually doesn't really exist, but at the moment it's being put away uh, for some future rainy day. We would say the rainy day for people who need homes or who are insecure in their current homes is now, and we would put that money into that fund as well. And we have argued, and I know there is a, a national body has been set up, but the, we, the proposals we made, it was before the government's one, was that there would be a, a state-led approach to this and there would be a national body that would drive it but would drive it in conjunction with the local authorities um, because ultimately it's the local authorities who largely have control of the land and we believe the local authorities should still be at the centre of this but they should be led and driven by a public policy and a public programme that would be monitored, that would be timelined uh, and that would have the power to ensure that the publicly owned land is actually used for, the, for social and affordable <coughs> housing. And um, b basically, we, the way we would construct this is by using some of the resources that are there already, including the Housing Finance Agency, the Housing Agency, and a lot of resources that NAMA has. Now, I know NAMA has a bad name in lots of ways, but it does have resources, and it does have land. And that land and those resources need to be used for the public purpose, purpose of addressing the housing crisis. So we would argue, that the, at the time when NAMA was set up, it was set up to, to deal with economic issues, to deal with the, the collapse of the banks, to deal with all of, the, all of that that went with that. But now it needs to be repurposed as a positive force uh, to ensure that we deal with the crisis of our time now, which is the housing and homelessness crisis. So we would, the, the policy that we're proposing is to set up this national body that would work then with local authorities to drive this and to ensure that it happens and the kind of malfunctioning that's going on at the moment that means it's taking years uh, to actually develop uh, and go ahead with, with local authority proposals that, that would, would be done. And we would suggest that local authorities could in, would cluster so that you would bring a, a number of local authorities to work together rather than build up that expertise in every single local authority. Um, that idea we got came directly from a proposal from the trade union movement in Cork uh, who had a proposal called One Cork, which was very much around this, using expertise, clustering local authorities together uh, and driving it to make it happen, because that's what we need to do. We actually need to make it happen, as opposed to, you know, the plans that take uh, endless amounts of time at the moment. Um, I was listening to somebody on the radio when I was coming down saying that you look at something, a social housing project that is just built now, it will have been at least five years when that was first considered and thought about. That is not good enough. We actually have to speed that up. And this is what we're proposing. Now, the other, um, some of the other things, I mean, the vacant homes absolutely need to be brought back into use. And um, we, we, that again needs to be driven. And the issues 
that are leaving homes, privately owned homes, uh, vacant for many years need to be addressed. But also, there are still local authority properties, and I think one of the problems is that housing is not considered a priority in terms of a career in local government, and it needs to be. It needs to be as important as economic development. I can see it in our own local authority again, that the, the economic development section of the council um, has a lot of, you know, a lot of sexiness, for want of a better word. Whereas those who are driving, supposed to be driving housing or working in housing really get very little credit or very little encouragement. That needs to fundamentally change and change it needs to be central. Um, the other thing um, that I wanted to talk about is around the whole issue of land hoarding. Um, because many, many years ago we had a thing called the Kenny Report, back in the 70s. And um, what that proposed was that basically you wouldn't gain uh, windfall profits by sitting on land that is suitable for housing development, but that you would only get the current value of it, which would be usually agricultural value, plus 25%. That was a very sensible proposal. And uh, again, we, we put that forward in legislation just in the last year or two. But we need that now. We're at a point now where land owners are again sitting on land at the very time when that land is needed to build homes. Uh, and they're sitting on it because they know they'll make a profit at a later stage. That needs to come in now. This is the appropriate time for it to happen as, as you know, the, the crash is recovered from at this stage, uh, largely, well, not for most people, but recovered in terms of the economy. Um, we need that implemented. And we need the, the vacant sites levy to work appropriately so that it actually is a discouragement to, to sitting on sites and leaving them vacant. Um, I, I also believe that we need, uh, and it's been said, and we've, uh, we, uh, we and other opposition parties have put forward a number of proposals with regard to security of people currently in the rented sector. Because while we are fixing basically the structural problems that are there, we need to protect people who are currently renting. And that can be people who are on a housing waiting list, it can be people who want to buy a home, but, uh, but simply because they're paying high rents, can't save for the mortgage, can't afford to buy a home. Or it can be people who, who do want to, you know, are happy to stay in private rented accommodation as long as they have security, both in terms of their tenure and in terms of their rent not going sky high. So there are a number, of, I don't have time to go into no, all details, but there are a number yeah. of proposals that we've made and indeed other opposition parties have made. But one of them is that one that Father Peter McFerry has just talked about, that for a temporary period, that people should not be evicted out of their homes into homelessness. Um, now, that will discommode landlords, there's absolutely no doubt about that. But I think we are in such a crisis situation that we need to take these kind of measures. Now, I will acknowledge that currently, uh, and Damien, I'm sure we'll talk about this, there is a bill going through uh, from government that is going to improve the situation. I won't deny that it has, it has brought in some improvements in terms of the private rented sector. But it's not enough. And we would argue that where people are being, for example, thrown out of their homes uh, because of the wide definition of a family member uh, who needs, who's, you know, going to move in, uh, often that family member can be quite a distant relative of the landlord, um, or other reasons that are given for uh, people being given termination of, of, of their tenancy. That needs to be tightened up to the benefit of the tenant. There, we need to get that balance in favour of the tenants in the current crisis situation that we're in. Now I'm very conscious that there are constitutional issues around private property and maybe that should be addressed as well. And certainly I, I do think we need to address the constitution as well. I do think we need to put a right to housing into the constitution. That doesn't mean you get home in the morning, but it does mean that it focuses the attention on the fundamental need for a home. And there are about 80 countries in the world that have either a constitutional or a statutory right to housing. Uh, Scotland is, is a near neighbour that uh, has been fairly successful, I think, in that regard. It, it focuses the attention uh, and redresses that balance again between the right to private property, which is in the Constitution, and the right to a home, which isn't. And I think that's a fundamental issue, and I know that that's been argued by many different organisations um, that you know, have, again, argued for this. And again, it would be largely supported, I think, right across the opposition. Um, and maybe among some members of government, I'm not too sure. But I, I think that those are, they may seem like they're, you know, something somewhat distant from the immediate problems. But actually, I think they're all part of that jigsaw because it is a very complicated jigsaw. And if people are sitting and hoarding on land, or if, if you know, if the priority is, is the, the property owner rather than the person's need of a home, then, you know, we're constantly going to have that kind of um, imbalance in what's happening. 
So I suppose just to summarise what I'm saying, I think there, the background is ethical, first of all. It is around um, that kind of the social values versus the, the, the private property and competitive things that have very largely ruled in, in the kind of globalised world that we live in. We need to go back and, and reclaim uh, the fact that we're all human individuals with human needs. We need to show solidarity with each other and we need to get our policy priorities based on that. And then we need to use what we have, which essentially is the family silver. It's the publicly owned land uh, that can be used. And whether that be uh, you know, the traditional social housing, whether it be affordable housing, and affordability should not be a percentage reduction of the market price. It should be related to people's ability to pay. Um, and also there are a number of other proposals like cost rental, which is now, uh, there is one, a couple of models that are starting in Dublin, which is very much based on the Vienna, if anybody knows what happens in Vienna, but many other European countries where um, people rent for life. Uh, and they, they pay in accordance with their, uh, with their, their ability to pay. So um, there are models out there. If people know the O'Coolan Voluntary Housing Association, which was able to build homes in Dublin for less than 200,000 because they were able to get the land from the council, uh, some of the development levies were waived, etc., and the profit motive was taken out. And I know it's been, it's been assessed by um, people like Mel Reynolds, Lorcan Sir, a lot of the experts who have all of the statistics, I'm not going to throw out statistics today, but that about 35% of the cost of a home is profit and land. In other words, the land that is needed to put the home on and the profit that's made by whoever builds it. So if you take those out, you can actually build affordably even in our cities. So. Um, I think these are the priorities. There are many other areas that you could talk about. The vacant, vacancy, obviously, is another one. I think there are specific sectors of the population that need focus, and I would, travellers in particular. Um, I think you, there, there is a need to change what's happening in relation to traveller accommodation, because most local authorities are still not even spending the amount of money that they're allocated for traveller accommodation. And I belong to a cross-party group on travellers' rights. I, I co-chair it with Senator Colette Kelleher. And um, that's very strongly uh, a point that is made uh, through that committee. So there are other areas like we need to ensure that we, we cater for our people as they grow older. We need to ensure that we cater for people who have a disability. So there are a number of, of specific areas that also you know, need focus. But I think the fundamental thing is that if we look at, again, go back to the individuals who are affected by this crisis. If we look that those people and everybody else has a right to have a roof over their head, has a right, a right to a place they call home that is not going to be taken from under them or that they don't have a fear that it will be taken from under them, then I think all policy has to flow from that. But as a, a spokesperson for housing, um, you know, I, I think it is also a responsibility of any political party, not just to describe the problem, but to actually propose viable, practical solutions to address that problem. So um, that's, I suppose, fundamentally what I wanted to say, Mary. Okay, Thank John, very thanks much. very much. Thanks. Um, thanks very much. I, I, I think, Minister, just from the discussion, um, most people here would agree that, you know, we've heard some really sensible, practical proposals, the general theme being that the state needs to use, as Jan called, the state silver, the public land we have, to build houses that would go mainly, make big inroads into, you know, uh, tackling the problem. The other one, I suppose, is the trying to, uh, you know, use the vacant sites. And I suppose the third most important one is to give tenants security of tenure and rents. They, you know, when we all hear this, they sound, you know, practical and, you know, why, why can't we do it? Do you want to talk us through maybe what the government is doing about it? Yeah. Thanks, Mary. No, yes. Very sorry, I went last. <laughs> First of all, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's always going to come to Kerry, to, but uh, more importantly, it's always come to, uh, to have an actual conversation around housing and homelessness. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll, I'll hold my clearer. It's always good to be here to, to actually have a decent conversation that we can focus in on some of the solutions put forward here, some of the uh, conversations we had about this, some of the commentary that's made over the, over the years, because I take offence some of the, some of the comments and I teach through that as well. Um, but very often in, in, in media and the journalists fault, it's very hard to actually have time for just a conversation to tease through some of these solutions. And I think as interested people who are here, but also as taxpayers and as commentators, you need to know what we're doing with our money and how it's been spent. And is it making a difference or is it not? So I'm happy to tease through a lot of the issues that were raised here. 
I'm conscious that the time is moving on, but I certainly, I'm, I'm here for the afternoon, so if we don't get to finish this session, I meet anybody that's interested for the rest of the afternoon to talk through this, because I, I, the, the housing and homelessness in this whole situation is very, very dear to my heart, uh, and I'm very, very happy to tease through any of the solutions, uh, just to be clear on that as well. Um, I, first of all, I do say, I, I do take offence to this accusation that the government don't care, or they're not interested, or they're ideologically opposed to it. It isn't actually true, and it's actually factually not true as well. And I think I want to be very, very clear with that. And I take offence with it because I come into politics uh, to make a difference and to help when it comes to planning and housing and many issues as well. And I understand, I've a, I'm a parent myself for four kids at home. I know how hard it is to manage our family in your own home. And never mind trying to manage that in an emergency situation or a hotel or a family home. It's not a nice place to be. I know that, the teacher knows that, and um, my department knows that. And we are determined in everything we do to address this on everyone's behalf here. Um, and to say that, we're, we, that, that anybody wouldn't want to do that, there's something wrong. I mean, who wouldn't want to solve this? And trust me, uh, as, a, as, a, as a politician, we like to be able to provide solutions. We like to deliver. We like to be able to, to people say we're doing a good job. So why wouldn't we try to fix this? So we want to get that into clear. We do want to fix this. Uh, and very often the conversation starts out as if there's nothing being done uh, and we're starting from scratch. Uh, and I want to be clear on that. That also is not the case. So I'm going to talk you through what we are doing. And a lot of the ideas I put forward here this morning make total sense. And we are, we are actually doing them and trying to do them, but it's, it's, it's taking a little bit longer in some areas, but also we need to do more of the same and increase the, 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 our efforts in different areas. But the solutions, the ideas we talked about, most of them are in our plans. And trust me, we are very, very happy at any stage to add in more solutions and more ideas as they come across, because we do want uh, to, to, to fix a homeless situation and to fix a housing situation. And that's the absolute truth, and, I, and it can't be any clearer than that, because, again, it's our duty and it's our job. And nobody saying in politics would, would, would accept what's there. Uh, and I have to say, all the work we're doing on the Rebuilding Ireland is support across party. And yes, different parties want more and different, different tweaking here and there, but there's nobody saying doing less. So I, I, when I speak on, on the Rebuilding Ireland Action Plan for housing, I don't just do it on behalf of my party or the government, I do it on behalf of the dollar, because everyone has supported everything we're doing there and want more. So I want to be clear on that too. We've got support throughout the country, because to, to implement our action plan for housing and all the different actions here, we had to have support right across the country because uh, as a government we can set the policy, we can allocate the funding, the taxpayers' money. This year by 2.6 billion, the, the highest it ever was. Your money being spent on housing to try to bring forward solutions as well. And it is making a difference, and I'll talk you through that in a second as well. But to do that, we have to engage with all the stakeholders. We have to work with all the local authorities, we have to work with all the NGOs, uh, and all the other volunteer groups who help and do great work with helping us in this area too. But a big part of our work was to reactivate the system. Because Fabio, you're right. The social housing system had stopped. There was nobody building local authority houses. Uh, and actually, uh, in 2006, 2007, when there was about 90,000 houses built in this country, private houses, and mind them were social houses. 5,000 out of 90,000. Now that's an ideological problem. That was. And that's changed. This year, in 2019, there'll be about 22, 23,000 houses built. We know at the end of the year exactly how many. In around that, 10,000 of them will be for social housing. 6,400 directly built by local authorities and housing bodies, and then other houses will be acquired and leased and so on. So that's the difference. 10,000 out of 23,000 will be used for social housing. In the past, that wasn't the case. So that proves that the whole thinking here, the ideology behind this has changed, and we are very much focused on doing that as well. So that's what's set the, the scene. A couple of issues we are doing. First of all, I think everyone admits the problem we, problems we have today are a dysfunctional housing market and a house building market. And our number one job was to fix a supply issue of houses and homes, because then we were able to give people permanent solutions. Naturally, during those couple of years, as we're trying to build all the new houses, we try to help families through this system as best we possibly can, through emergency accommodation, be it family hubs or be it hotels, to make that as short a journey as possible into a new home. It does mean, while we're building the new houses, that we have to work with the private sector, and we use a scheme called HAP, which is Housing Assistance Payment, but we pay most of the rent for people in a house uh, who can't afford their own house while we wait to build them a new house. And I'm always told on a regular basis that we shouldn't do HAP. HAP is a waste of money. But just to be clear now, about 44,000 families today are in a HAP-supported house funded by the taxpayer. If we didn't use that scheme, if we didn't use taxpayers' money to rent a private house in the short term, those families wouldn't have a house today. So it's not that I want to use the private sector. We have no choice in the short term, but we want to correct that by increasing the social housing stock every year uh, over the next number of years uh, by a certain amount, and that's what we're trying to do as well. So we are committed uh, to, in, in, 
the next three or four years, by 2021, to deliver 50,000 new social houses. Uh, and every year thereafter, the money is set aside in the 10-year capital plan, again, your money, to deliver up to 11,000 social houses every year up until uh, 2028. And beyond that, different governments have been charged, and we'll see what they do. But you have to put those plans in place today to get the results over the next 10 years. And that didn't happen in the past, and that's why we have this problem. So in terms of supply of housing, um, and I, I, I'll jump around a little bit here, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short, I cut me off from going too long. First of all, we had to make sure there are our supply of housing. Uh, and yes, um, three years ago, 2016, there was less than 600 social houses built in this country. Last year, that was close to 4,000. This year, it is at 6,400 new social houses that will be built by local charities. So they start from scratch. So we had to go in there and reprogram their thinking, restaff them, give them the resources, go site by site to start this house building program again. And I'm often, I often hear from, from uh, commentators that there's no social house building program. That's not true. There is. My job, I'm in the housing delivery unit, I week to week, day by day, I visit all the local authorities, I go on these sites, I look at what's happening, and we discuss all the plans to make sure it's happening. Because in the past, and Jan is right, money was allocated, big announcements, but nothing happened on the ground. But just, so we, just so to, we had to fix all that, yeah, yes? Just Sorry, Maya. Maybe just to clarify on that for you. Um, like, we do we do accept there's, you know, there's a lot being done, but mm. Jan and, and Father McVeary seem to be saying that this is an emergency, yes. that we need we need to maybe do more quicker. Absolutely, no, and, and, and I've come to that as well. Yeah. But again, what we're asked to do is is to get to a stage where we're building 10,000 social houses a year. And that's where we are, get to this year. But mm -hmm. that work, that plan had to start in 2016 when we put our plan together to make it actually happen by now. Because I wish you could, but you just can't click fingers and get 50,000 houses. Mm -hmm. You have to put the plans in place. We had to reorganise the system. We had to change the planning system. We had to change the process. Jan is right. Um, only a couple of years ago, to, uh, a social housing project could take six or seven years to come through the system. Uh, so we, we went in there and completely changed that now, that you get on site now uh, in 58 weeks, and you can build a house in six months thereafter as well. That's in line with the private sector. A couple of years ago, I've seen projects taking 10 years to through the system. So that's now gone. Local authorities have no excuse now for that anymore. There's resources there, money's there, and land is there as well. So on the pipeline of projects, we, we now know for 19, 20, 21, all the sites are set, set across. There's a 1,000 different projects sanctioned for your money as well to build houses every week over the next couple of years. And we know what's happening on that end. So that's the social housing building program. It is to go to 10,000 by 2021 and then to go to 11 and 12,000 thereafter. That's a commitment on that. So that means in the future we won't have this crisis. And so just what to do clarify here? on that then, mm. you know, Father McCurry was saying that it's only 30% of, yes. of state-owned land is allocated for okay. social housing. He, he's proposing, and I, I understand Labour is, that we lose all the public land for public yeah. housing. That That's what needs to happen. Okay, and, and, and that's... that's a view people put across as well. So to explain to you what's happened there as well, on, on, on the social housing bill program, they're all state-owned lands and they're all fully developed social houses. So every site we go on to could be 100 or 200 or generally 50 or 60 social houses. There's 298 sites today, state-owned, fully for social housing. That's happening. Okay? And then the pipeline of new projects as well. The conversation around the 30 or 40 percent are for the larger sites. We, we again, trying to manage land for the state and for the future. And this, we know we have enough land to build about 50,000 houses. It isn't 130,000 because we don't own all that land. NAMA control the loan books, but we don't own the land. And people who own a loan with NAMA are entitled to try to work that out and pay their debts down and develop their land. Naturally, we try to encourage them to, to build social housing as well. But we don't own that land. And that's a mistake in the conversation that people say the state owns the land. We don't. So any land we do own, we, uh, we have now, we've mapped all the lands, we've gone through all the sites, and on the larger sites, um, we're, we, we have to say, right, what do you, you go to a site that could deliver, we say, um, in, on the, on the old uh, mental hospital, central mental hospital in, in Dundrum, that can deliver about 3,000 houses. And we now have that been mapped out and been developed and planned and so on. We don't believe we get the best result by putting 3,000 social houses on that. Uh, we don't believe we get the best result for the taxpayer because A, the taxpayer can't fund all the housing. We want to get a social housing mix here. So we're saying on that site, about 40% of it will be used for social and affordable. And the rest of it will, will be used to develop private housing for all those who want to buy their own house. And we'll work on that to make sure there's a reasonable price there and so on. But the land's not given away. We'll use the money from that land to subsidise the housing and to make cheaper housing as well. So that's, that is an ideological decision. We, we don't believe that what happened in the past, putting thousands of social houses in one area, is a solution. It leads on to many other problems. We want a proper social integration where you get a mix of houses. So that's, that's what we're doing on those sites. 
And every site we go to around the country, we'll take it won't be exactly 30% or exactly 40%, it's a minimum 40%. And it can be more. And a lot of the sites even being developed privately today are coming in at 30 or 40% social housing because they can't actually sell them on the private market, so they come to the state to buy them. So that's just on, on terms of site management and what we're doing in terms of planning. They, then the issue, again, again is well, someone today is in an emergency accommodation, what do we do? And again, you need to know, people need to have a little bit of hope here. We do intervene as much as we possibly can with families who are going to be, going to be homeless. Last year, 5,200 adults and their children were helped out of a homeless situation and into a house. Uh, through all the different systems, all the different solutions that we have here, which I'm happy to go through. And many of them are working with the McVeary Trust, working with Focus Ireland, working with all the N NGOs, the pool housing bodies. We're working that system there, and those people are found a home. And I think it's important that we, we do recognise that too, because people who are in emergency accommodation today need to know there's some hope here. There is a plan that is going to deliver houses. And we know, with the budget set aside for this year, another 5,000 plus adults, and all their thousands of children, will be out of emergency accommodation and will be in a, will be in a home. In a month just gone, roughly about 180 families presented as homeless uh, in emerge, came, to, came looking for emergency accommodation. We were able to find 120 of those families a house and a home there and then. It's not the permanent house forever, it's through the HAP scheme, it's a rented house, they can not even hear a rented house, and they're in accommodation, so they've been prevented from going in there. The difficulty is about 80 families uh, that we couldn't find them a home, or it didn't suit their needs, or whatever, so there's about another 80 in that moment coming into emergency accommodation. So the difficulty is we can help and we are trying to help thousands of families come through the system. The difficulty is so every month a couple of hundred more families still present, so we have to we have to deal with that. And we do try and find them homes through the HAP scheme and so on, or through other programs as well. So when we work with those families, we now have uh, additional social social workers in the system to work with those families. We have a thing called uh, Place Finder where we have individual people working on behalf of the state, sit down with those families day one, talk with them about what their thinking is, what their plans are, where their children go to school, where they want their house, and try to find them a solution there and then. And we work very well with a lot of the NGOs doing that work as well. So that happens on a daily basis and we try to find them a home. In some cases we can't find them a home that suits their needs or in the right place or it takes a little bit of time. It could take three months or six months in some cases. Those families then would enter into a marriage accommodation in a family hub or a hotel, which is not where we want anyone to be. But they're a temporary solution to, to make sure people are not living in, in a hostel or on the street. They're in a, a better place for a family. It's no way a deal, and they move on to home as quickly as they possibly can as well. And the majority of families are removed through that system into a home. And, and they don't all get the new permanent social house because there was a housing waiting list that you have to work off that as well. But they get a family home through a half scheme or so on as well. So that's, that's one of the solutions there. I'm try, trying to be in more stock. The vacancy issue is often used. And we, naturally, all of us go street by street and you see vacant properties. And you scratch your head wondering, why is there vacant properties on one side of the street and a homeless family on the other side of the street? A lot of these properties uh, are privately owned. The state did own about up to 10,000 vacant properties and worked up started by Jan and continued, continued by us and brought all them back into use. So all the state, the, about 10,000 vied houses, houses that were empty, have been fixed up now and brought back into the system as well. There's still about another, I'd say, another seven or 800 out there, which will be completed this year and there'll be no more empty houses belong to the state, back in use as well. When there are vacant properties that we don't own, we can't just go in and grab them. There is a CPO process. We've asked local authorities to work that system. We've given them more funding, more people to do that as well, that they can go through a process to CPO a house and take it over and do that. But we try to work with the people who own them. And we have a couple of schemes there called the Repair and Lease Back, the Portals are new, where we can go in and we offer people grants to fix up their house and then lease them back to the state. And they've worked quite well. We thought we would get thousands down. We've only got about 1,500, but we're going to keep chasing more as well. There's the Portals are new. The councils have been given the funding to go in and buy any house that's empty, that's vacant and needs, needs repairing. They, they buy that, they draw down the funding and they fix up that house. And I've seen loads in Limerick and Waterford and Kerry all over the country. Fabulous houses, but we want more of them. And we need more of them. That's what we have to do as well. So I'm, I know I'm jumping around there as well. Maybe, the banks was touched yeah, on. Yeah. Just on the rental side, I'm yes. just conscious. I don't mean to. Yeah, I wasn't sorry. I was going to come to that yet. Yeah. So, so apart from people finding people a home, then when the family comes to us and says they're going to be homeless, immediately we try to intervene there now, which, which didn't happen in the past. And that's why thousands of families <coughs> entered the system because nobody was able to help them probably in 14, 15, and 16 quick enough. Now we try to intervene much quicker, and we sit down with them and we go back to their existing landlord. And we try and deal there through, through incentives and to keep them in that house. If it's a landlord, if the house is house for sale, absolutely, Father. The local authorities have been told if there's a client that's going to be homeless in a house that's for sale, the state is able to buy that and does buy them houses. 
and we have an acquisition program, or an acquisition program, we go out and buy up those houses. So if there's a client going to come home, this house is for sale, we do go in there and try to buy the house, keep them in, the, in, in that as well. Not having a reason that process, but we think it's right. Uh, we keep them in the home as well. And also gives you good social integration because there's no secret to disperse around different places as well. So we do do that as well. But in some cases, the, there is rogue landlords, and that is an issue. And so there is new legislation, as Janice said, coming through the dog uh, the, in the month ahead to change that and to strengthen the position of tenants and to give them greater rights, greater securities, and to strengthen the powers of the RTB to manage those tenants' rights as well, to give them a much stronger position as well. And we will, we are constantly looking at how we can do even more uh, to encourage landlords to provide a better service, longer tenancies, and things like that to keep them in. And because it is right to say, we say of the 200 families who become homeless every month, it's roughly half and half. Half for reasons to do with rent, or economics, or banks, or wages, and the other half is to do with family issues and social issues. It's not 100% to do with rents or banks. It's roughly 50-50, because we ask everybody what their story is, and we tease through that as well. So there's different solutions there if we go through that as well. So the banks was mentioned, uh, that the loads of empty properties, we buy those empty properties. Uh, we've gone to the banks now, we've done deals, with, I think at this stage about 1,600 houses have been bought off the banks and brought back into use. Uh, and it's been, you're right, it's been a bit of a job to drag some of those banks uh, to the table to get those properties off them, because in many cases, they don't even know where they are. But we now have a tracker system, we go out and we check all the vacant properties. There's a vacancy home office in every local authority with staff now who literally go street by street to look at vacant properties, to get behind it, see who owns it, see what the story is, and we try to engage in conversation to get those back in. Because like, they are the quickest win for us if we can get vacant property back into use as well. So I'm just touching on some of the schemes there. There's lots more I could, I could touch on, and I'm happy yeah. to do it in conversation, but there are actions we want to do more of it, and yeah. increase more of it, because we want to get to a stage that we have that minimum 10,000 plus social housing okay. here. If we can do that, and I'll finish with this. Most people might remember we had a jobs action plan back in 2012. Richard Bruton led it. Uh, at the time I was the junior minister, we had that department. It was a five year plan we put together, whole of government approach, exactly what Father Pinkman Barry touched on here as well. And we brought all the government departments together on the table and we put in place a five, a five year plan. I recall in year two and a half, three of that, we were getting kicked around the place, being told that plan isn't working, where's the jobs and so on. Nobody would believe us. We knew we had changed the systems, but the processes in place, got all the different interventions needed to create jobs. And over the, by the end of the five years, the unemployment was gone from 16% down to 6% because there was a whole of government approach, everybody involved to make it happen. We've taken the exact same approach with housing. And yes, it's a five year plan. We're now in year, just gone year two and a half. And I am very confident, I have no problem saying this and defending this, that if we stick to that plan and keep spending that money in the right way with all the different solutions, as well as bringing more protections for tenants as well and deal with the rental market, we will have solved this. I have, I have no doubt about that. Um, but we need to, and, and, I, and part of that is adding in new ideas, not against new ideas. I read through Jan's policy here and there's a lot of good stuff on that as well, so we will do that. But there is a logical plan there if we follow it, and it is the of government. We bring all the departments together, social protection, health, uh, uh, the children, everyone's in together to make this happen. But, and it's short term solutions, but also with the long term plan that this can't happen again. Okay. And I'm sorry if I've choked around a bit, but I'm happy to come back to any individual. Okay, Minister. Alright, thanks very much. Thanks. Um, I'm conscious of the time. And just very quickly, Father McFerry, I just saw you shaking your head there a few times. Do you want to just maybe, did you, did you want to just comment on some of the points there? Yeah, I think the argument. Uh, uh, between, say, ourselves and the government go like this. The government tells us everything they're doing. Yeah. And I have no problem with that. Well, I support everything they're doing. But it's not working. <laughs> if you had a company and you were losing money every month, you would be told, get a plan in place to reduce your losses and eventually to eliminate them. If for two and a half years, every month, the losses continue to increase, I think any 12-year-old would say, no, they, they, this policy isn't working, you've got to change your policy. Dublin City Council have predicted that a homeless crisis in Dublin is going to continue for at least the next three years. That means that for the whole of rebuilding Ireland, homelessness, which is meant to reduce homelessness, homelessness is going to increase. To my mind, that is a failure. Okay, Minister, yeah, I reply there, yeah. And, just, and, I, and I, I accept that if you look at the figures month by month and there's still around 10,000 people homeless, it's hard to believe that anything is working. But I think you genuinely would need to go and ask the 5,200 families last year who were homeless, who are now in the house, and they'll tell you that it's worked for them. And yes, it's not working very well because it can't work fast enough because it just takes a little bit of time to get all the houses we need built. And we will do all, every other measure we can and any solutions people have. And in fairness, uh, 
Justine, you mentioned earlier on about Ruffs, about Ruffs Leapers and what's happened there. In the last, probably since 2011, we've added an additional 1,000 uh, beds of emergency accommodation, kind of hostel style accommodation. A lot of them are ran by them, very trusting, they're ran very well. They're very temporary, they're for single people. But that was to keep people off the streets because we don't want, we, nobody should be on the street. There's no need for that. And, and again, I'm going to mention this. We, on a nightly basis, directly through our own departments and also through a lot of the NGOs, we are on the streets every night of the week, meeting those people who are, who are rough sleepers. And it, it varies between 150 and 160, depending on the council, on the, on the streets every night of the week around the country. And there's others in, in, in hostels which will be on the streets if there wasn't a hostel. But on the streets, we engage with them and we talk with them. And we try to encourage them to come in and engage in the services. And it is correct to say that a lot of those people would not have come in two or three years ago because the services weren't up to any kind of standard. And there would have been possibly drugs or abuse there and so on. But in, in, the, in the majority, probably 90% plus of our hostel accommodation now, that's completely changed. And it's, it's a, it's a, there's, there's kind of a, a much more re acceptable standard there for emergency accommodation that people are happier to stay in. Most of it is 24 hours to get a six-month tenancy as well. So this thing of the past of you ring a number at night and, and you get a bed for a night and, and it happens every night, that still happens for a certain number of people, but very few. Uh, but the majority of emergency accommodation beds now are permanent for six months and they've been ran by other groups on, on our behalf and they've been ran well so that's that's tackling that end of it. Sorry, so some of this. sorry, I'm sorry. So, yeah. In the 19th century there were two men who were called Charles Stuart Parnell, the other was Michael Dunnett and they fought for fair rent and fixity of tenure. So I suggest that if you are serious about dealing with the housing issue in this country that you pass emergency legislation that will not allow a man or a woman to walk into a family in a house in Dublin and say, the son is home from Australia next month and I need the house. Yeah. And then it's immediately put up for sale. Yeah, that's, that's very, no, you're absolutely right. And we have moved to change that because that has happened. And I said, it, I'm, not, I'm not saying there's not rogue landlords, there absolutely are, all right? Uh, and the legislation doesn't allow for that now. It uh, depends how long you're in the house, there's certain rights you have to know what you have to get. The Residential Tenancies Board have been given extra staff and extra legal powers that if that happens, if a landlord claims they're selling a property for a, for a family member and they don't follow through and just put the rent up for the next tenant, we deal with that and that's unwound and the person gets, gets their house back. So that can't happen. The legislation wasn't, in our view, strong enough and in fairness, a lot of the opposition to ask us to change it. So that's, that's happened now during this month to make the legislation even stronger because absolutely we want that to end. We also have to encourage um, more and more properties of all different shapes and sizes to be built as well and we do want to encourage that too so and again there's a constitution there in this country people have got certain rights and when it comes to properties i mean trust me a lot of the vacant properties out there i wish we could just go in and just grab them we can't do that they are privately owned we'll find new ways and we do find ways but there is so also a constitution yeah, okay. the a report said that the common good superseded the individual right Yes. Yeah, so that's why we have a. That's why, following from that, we have a CPO process, which is a process that any local authority here, Kerry, Cork, Waterford, can go through if they want to take over a vacant property. But there is a legal process there. It does take a few months, yeah. okay. and they are doing that. Okay, we have another question here. Just, I'll, I'll come back to you, Father. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, I mean, so just to come back to this lady's point here, just about um, greater rights for tenants. I, I know two people who have been asked, they've been given their notice from their landlord to leave um, their houses, one was a one parent household. Um, she, we've actually gone, we went to Threshold, we saw what her rights, her rights was to ask for an extra month in her notice period. We went to the RTB, so we went to there, and they said, well, the landlord's telling you it's gone on sale, but listen, if it's not on sale after three months, come back to us, you'll enter into a process here, we might get your refund on some rent after you find a new house. Now that young woman, she's a one parent household, she's having to leave Dublin to move to Drogheda. Her son has gone to school in Dublin. So they have to move because she can't afford anywhere in North Dublin. She has no rights. She has no rights as a tenant. She's no, it's just exactly the same. You said, you said here there's processes. Those processes aren't working for people like her. Yeah, I don't know if, she, if she's, if she's a private. Sorry, she's yeah. a private. She's a private she right. was living there for five years. Okay. She works. I think she earns, I don't think she might be saying her way, she earns about 44,000 a year. Sorry, I know her really well. And um, she's, like, she's no rights. She's never, never been late paying her rent. Nothing. Okay, just to be clear on that. If she's there five years, she has about six or seven months notice she has to get. Notice. 
it's, it's gone up in the, in yeah. the legislation yeah. now. Three months yeah. initially, and yeah. it was increased to four increased. months after the threshold. And at, at five years, it's, it's gone up again on the new legislation coming in. So we recognise that too. But also, if that person identified, we would try to work with our landlord to see can we solve that problem with her and keep them there. Because he's he's now in, like, because he we went to the RTB yeah. and they said, okay, sorry to hear that's happened. Mm -hmm. You've gone to threshold, you've got your advice. Um, listen, should we go to the new house, come back to us if the house is back on the market sold, yeah. and we'll come back to, and we'll see what we can do then. No, and she might get maybe the difference in rent in the new place. paid back to her. But, but yeah. I mean, she's been looking, like she lives in Swords at the moment and she's paying €1,200 Euro a month for a two-bed apartment, which is quite good. We were looking around for other apartments, like the equivalent now in Swords in that area is at €2,000 a month. I, there's another woman I know at work, she's paid €700 Euro for a box room, a box room in South Dublin, you can't even swing your cat in it. And she's been given notice to quit as well. And, uh, look, if there's, I'm not going to try to, to defend that. There's two issues here. Number one, we are bringing in more rights and more legislation, right? And in, uh, hopefully in the budget as well, there'll be other incentives to encourage longer term leasing because we want to try to get to a proper functional rental market in this country. The difficulty for us is, we can bring in new legislation, you can bring in changes and so on, but there's an, an issue of supply as well. And we have to get more houses built. And that's why yeah. when we started off here, there was literally zero houses built in this country. In 2015, there was less than 8,000 houses. Most of them are one-off in the country. I, I right? understand. And, and, and I'm not, I'm not yeah. saying that it's, I've got a solution for you tomorrow, but there was no other way about building more and more houses and strengthening the I, I the, the needs which just we're exactly, to do. It just goes back to what Peter McVary was saying there. It's about the people who earn too much for social yeah. but aren't earning enough for a mortgage. And I haven't, like, I work as a journalist, I haven't seen anything in the area of tenants' rights or strengthening tenants' rights in the past five years. I was quite shocked when she got her notice. I was like, my God, you can work really hard, you're one parent household, you do nothing wrong, you pay your rent on time, but it counts for absolutely nothing because the landlord can come in and say, you know what, you're going to have to go because I'm selling the apartment. Yeah, no, and, and look, I'm not saying everything's fixed perfect, but we are trying to improve the rental market. There has been a, a good few changes, in fairness, what we started by Alan Kelly. In, in the rental sector market. And there was new legislation in 2016 around the rent pressure zones, which helped, which is trying to keep the rent, I just want to finish the point, which is trying to keep the rent inflation down. In my view, the legislation came in probably too late, the damage is already done. But the changes going through this month will strengthen that. It doesn't mean a person has the endless right to live in a house. And we haven't got to that stage. I know some of the campaign are saying that you bring in a law that says you can't, you can't put somebody out of a house. Right, but there's difficulty with that, and, and it is genuinely been looked at on the, uh, with, with our attorney general to see can we do something in that space, see what we can do. Because it gets, to the give landlord's the game in the yeah. pressure zone. No, yeah, sorry, the, just yeah, can and I, the, like, we no, can go right back and forward. Yeah. 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 No, but the last point I make is you're, you're absolutely right, the landlords have gamed the legislation, and that's why we brought in new legislation and strengthened the powers of the RT, because there are landlords who have gamed it. Now, some haven't, but some have, and we will catch them. And now it'll be, it'll be a criminal offence if they break the law, which it wasn't in the past. Yeah. Would you agree that maybe the area of tenants' rights does need to be strengthened? Yes. Like, and would Absolutely. you see that well, as we'll a priority? Yes, and that's what we're doing. And we, yeah. we want to, I need to do more of it, but yeah. also we need to increase okay. more properties. We're trying to make that price yeah. down Could too. Could I just make yeah, a very brief yeah. point on that? And it's a very practical point, I suppose. That legislation is actually going through the houses of the Oireachtas at the moment. It was in committee last week, the week before. It's coming back into the Dáil uh, when the Dáil resumes in a week's time. Uh, and then it goes to the Shannon. I think as a legislature, we actually have the opportunity to make it stronger, and I think we should. Yeah. Uh, I think the time, you know, there, there, this is a very, very crucial time when we need to address the balance. It's a, it's, it's a fairly practical yeah. point, but, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. that is what we are about. That's what we're there for as legislators. We do actually need to respond to people like your friend yeah. and make sure that they have security. Yeah, thanks. There's a lady here who's been very patient, yes? Yeah. You can get your microphone up here, yeah, just for a second now. Um, and I'm conscious, I'm sorry, we're coming up to half one, so just, I'll take one or two more more uh, questions from the audience, and I'm sorry, but we have to... Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll come back to you on that, yeah. Sorry, this lady here, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. And thanks to the four speakers, it was very interesting listening, and I suppose what strikes me very much is there is a, an ideology behind it all and that's what's got us here and and i i think it's no news to anybody that it is the uh, ideology of the free market neoliberalism that has got us in this situation it didn't happen overnight right. that we have all this homelessness and i'd also like to challenge the minister, minister in the way you spoke about taxpayers <clears throat> and i what i heard was that there's a divide between people in the hap scheme people who are homeless and the taxpayer. We are all taxpayers in this country. You can't go outside the door without paying tax. 
And I really get annoyed when I hear about the taxpayer as opposed to people who are in need, for example. They're taxpayers too. And just one more thing, if I may. Um, just one more thing. Um, if I remember rightly, Enda Kenny campaigned way back, not the last election, the one before, that he was going to remove the veto from the bank about making people homeless. I didn't hear any more about that when you got into power. Okay, I think we just give the minister a chance to respond yeah. there. Yeah. In, in fairness, yeah, I absolutely, when I say taxpayers, I mean everybody that pays tax. We all pay tax. But what I meant is, that you need to know that you, everyone pays tax. Your money, 2.4 billion of it, has been spent on housing solutions and more again. So your money has been committed and has been spent back. There was a pressure given earlier on that there isn't money being spent in government and the Department of Finance are against housing. And no offence, but that, that's, that's not a true statement because the I mean, Department of Finance. Why would they not spend money on housing? And the Department of Finance do not want house prices to go up on, on people with high rents. That's not their agenda. And I think that's, to be honest with you, that's, it's, it's a strange comment to make. I won't even go any further on it, but that's not the agenda. But for, I, I, in fairness, I, taxpayers, I mean everybody. That's not what I meant, right, at all. What I meant was, we use the taxpayers' money in many different ways. It doesn't always get spent on a brand new social house. Sometimes it's used to subsidise rent or something or to help somebody who needs a little bit of help temporarily for a couple of years, not a permanent social house as well. There's many different schemes. I've only touched on some of them here. And that's what I meant by taxpayers' money. It's not my money, it's not the government's money. It's the taxpayers' money. That's what I, that's probably the way I, I, I explain it as well. The issue in relation to the banks, uh, and again, mortgage arrears. And again, I'm often, I'm always told in different programs that there's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people put out of the home by the banks. That genuinely is not happening. Uh, and we encourage, it did happen in the past, some families didn't know there was a process they could through that could get help from the state and they probably threw the keys back and, or were bullied by the bank or whatever. But now it's a much different conversation. There's a state-ran service there in Parliament Wallet. Uh, they work with MABS, they work with three or four thousand clients and they're involved in working with the people and the banks through all the different solutions. And there's one there called the mortgage to rent where if someone is in the mortgage that is very much unsustainable and they might never be in a position to ever pay back the debt of 300,000. There's a scheme there now called mortgage to rent where the banks are all involved with this now. We get involved and the state buys that house, and the person stays in that house for the rest of their life and pays the rent. Okay. So, so, so yeah. there are solutions there. We try to naturally keep them in their own home as well as possible, but sometimes it's just not possible. Yeah. Some local authorities don't even know about the mortgage to rent scheme. It's not being pushed by the Department of Housing. Some local authorities, if you go to them about the mortgage to rent, they scratch their heads. So it, it's, it's the solution, you know. Obviously, any 12-year-old child would say, you know, you buy the house, leave the people in it, and now they pay a rent to whoever has bought the house. That mortgage to rent scheme is very limited. Your income has to be below a certain level. The cost of the house has to be below a certain level. I would be arguing the mortgage to rent scheme has to be extended to uh, include almost all houses uh, in mortgage arrears of more than two years, except unless you're living in a million euro mansion. And it must be extended to landlords as well, because that's the forgotten mortgage to rent section. The landlords, 12,000 of them, uh, the mortgage to rent should be extended to uh, landlords, which it isn't uh, available. Just a quick in, in fairness, Father, yeah, you're right, we have changed the mortgage rent scheme. The, 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 the scheme has been uh, uh, increased on an income size of house and so on. But also, there's, there's two different versions of it. Uh, so nearly anybody who needs help with a mortgage now, it's a two different mortgage rent schemes. And you're absolutely right, some local authorities have refused to use it or ignored it. But trust me, they know it's there because I've been in every local authority's office and I've told them about it and I've told them we want the numbers and now we track every week what they're doing in relation to mortgage to rent because some were not using it. Thanks. I just, we're really running out of time. I, I'm going to take quick questions. Um, this lady in the front had your hand up first, yeah. Um, there was a situation lately uh, where Cluid, uh, the housing agency, bought an apartment block in Cork and I think there was 30, 40, 50 apartments in it. Uh, wasn't that yep. a very uh, practical thing to do and why aren't there more examples of that uh, instead of selling apartment blocks to, um, to vulture firms? We genuinely, we, that's what we do every day of the week. We buy up. It was clear, right? That, that got out of media coverage because there was private tenants still in that when they bought it. 57 of the properties were empty and they've now been bought, and the whole has been bought by the state, uh, and, they've, and they've offered them out uh, on, the, on this kind of choice bait letting. Interesting who's looked to with those apartments. That's something we can analyse and discuss again, but they're, they'll be made available. We do, every day of the week, the different housing bodies and the local authorities have to finance and do buy up properties. In, in tens or twenties or single houses and they're doing that 
we want them to build more as well, and we don't want them to kind of stop building and just buy houses, because some of our tourists would love the chance to do that, ease off on building again, which brings us back to where we were in the first place. So we're saying, no, keep building new houses, but also buy up vacant properties, but don't compete with the first time buyer. So if you're in, say, me today, and there's a house vacant, the local authority goes in and says, we will buy this house, but if a local person or a first time buyer or somebody comes to buy this house, we will back off, because they don't compete. Uh, but in that case, they're only competing with, with a fund. And so they, 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 they took them all in one. And we encouraged more of that. The difficulty in that situation was that in the last year or two, local authorities didn't want to buy up um, large scale developments if there were still some private tenants in there because they're not supposed to buy houses for private tenants. So we said, look, guys, buy them up and we'll figure that out. Don't be, don't be put off by that. Because again, we, we try to adapt as we go along. But I, okay. there's, so it, it is we've done, and we'll do more. Thanks, Mr. I just really have time for one more question. That man down there, that's, yeah, because we are running out of time. Yeah. Um, hello. Um, I'm a bit uncomfortable about the, the, the homelessness and the affordable, affordable housing debate wrapped in one box. They do overlap, but they are essentially two different stories. Okay, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that 50% uh, of the world's population now lives in cities for the first time, and that will increase to 70% in the next 20 years. So we are in a new dynamic and in a new, a new situation which requires new solutions. There's been a bit of knocking of uh, vulture funds buying up apartment blocks. We're actually confusing vulture funds, which were from the NAMA period, with professional landlords. <coughs> And in places like Dublin in particular, there is a demand for large-scale rental property as well as owner-occupier, uh, mobile workers and everything else. And there's a view that professional landlords, large-scale professional landlords, will be far better than individuals who own one or two apartments to let, who don't love them properly, and who abuse tenants' rights. So it's not necessarily t t t t two, two wrongs in that. And I suppose the final thing I would say is, um, in terms of, there's an element of this being a Dublin problem. Affordability is not a problem in Limerick, where I come from, where Jen comes from. Affordability, you can buy, a garden, a teacher can live in Limerick, and they can buy a house at 250000 The same house is costing 450 or 500000 in Dublin. They have to commute further, and their childcare is... So there is, we need to be careful that we don't over-generically kind of rob the problem into one particular area. And I suppose, finally, what I would say to the panel is, what will success look like in five years' time? Okay, very quickly because okay, we are. Right. Does, does in terms of, yeah, in terms of the long term thing with the housing as well, just again to make sure a big part of our work is to have a sustainable construction sector. And in the past, we had 90,000 houses one year, 10,000 the next year, 5,000 the year after. We were all involved in construction and for all your families who might want to go into apprenticeships and jobs and investments and so on. We need to have a sustainable construction sector. We know that in the next, for, oh, so we've worked this out for, up, up to 2040. We need about 28,000 houses a year, every year. And we're going to try and manage supply in and around that every year. And that means moving population away from the East Coast, away from Dublin. There is to 2040, which is the long-term plan here to make sure we manage construction of houses so that we can't end up in the mess we were in. Again. And that, that would deal with the, the cities and affordability and so on. But, but, and again, uh, the gentleman is right. There's a difference between homelessness and affordable and so on. We do break down into different sectors. We're just touching on things here quite quickly today as well. The, and you're right, though, in relation to the, the, the vulture funds and the vulture funds commentary. And the vulture fund is, a, is, is dealing with people who go in and buy up banks, distressed properties, and in other countries can throw somebody out the next day. That doesn't really happen in Ireland because there's a lot of protections here. And if a vulture fund or any other fund wants to move you out of a house, they have to go through a whole legal process in the, in the courts, which will take four or five years. So they don't get to do what they do in other countries in Ireland. We don't allow that because the law doesn't, doesn't allow that. What's spying on the conversation is there are investors who buy up investment properties. And there always was in this country. Uh, but generally there were, there were people buying a second home. Seventy percent of landlords in this country are, are individual people who own a second or third house. We do want to encourage uh, more uh, professional landlords and professional land rental sector in the long term. The difficulty is now, when they come in now and as a fund and buy up uh, houses, because rents are so high, it looks as if they're abusing the market and make, and make a fortune. But I want to be clear on this. We do encourage a mixture of investors and houses. The market, if you analyse the market over the last 20 years, a certain percentage are ourselves buying our own homes. There's always a certain amount of investment. It shouldn't go too high. It should only be about 3 or 4%, which is that. And then there's also the social housing. And we have to, to have a, a functional housing market across the board. To get to 30,000 a year, you will need all different types of investors. And it shouldn't be 
heavy balance yeah. to one fund at all. That's not what's happening at all. We do manage that just. I'm, go I'm going to let point. each of the speakers just make a final point yeah. and then we will have to finish. I just yeah. want to make one what I think is a very important point. In terms of social mix, I agree with the Minister, we don't want to build you know, vast swathes of, of just people in a certain income category, social housing, commonly described. But you get a social mix if you do social and affordable on state owned land. And I would make that as a very strong point. I still fundamentally disagree with the idea that 40% or whatever the 60%, whatever the percentage is of the housing that's built on state owned land, that that would be in the private profit market. In other words, whatever the market can afford. That's where I fundamentally dis disagree with the current government house on state owned land. I think you can get a social and affordable, you can get a social mix if you have affordable housing which is for those squeezed middle people who can't afford to buy, who can't get a mortgage, who, can, who are paying astronomical rents. If you have some of that housing on the publicly owned land for that category of people, along with people who are on social housing lists, then you will get a social mix. And you will uh, deal with substantially the, the big issues that are out there now with regard to people who need housing. Thank you, Jan. Justine? It's so often it happens that when a measure or a piece of legislation is proposed uh, that would improve the lives of the citizens, uh, somebody shouts, stop, you can't do that because of the uh, constitutional property rights. It happens again and again and they're seldom tested. And I think as long as that remains the case and constitutional property rights remain unbalanced, Bunratnaheran is a, a blueprint for the capitalist model and for unfairness and in, uh, inequality in our country. Um, when, for instance, uh, Francis Fitzgerald was Minister for Justice and Ireland was delaying and delaying ratifying the Istanbul Convention on Domestic Violence, um, she was advised by her civil servants that she could not ratify it because it would contravene property rights because uh, it, it involved removing property owners, violent property owners from their properties. And she said, no, let's test it. I'm going to draft, well, let's draft the legislation. Let's run it through the Oireachtas. And we now have a really good piece of legislation that is going to protect primarily women's lives and children's lives uh, much more vigorously than in the past, I think could still be more robust. Um, but I think that as long as that remains unaddressed, it shows the attitude is the problem. You can make all the piecemeal reform in the world you want, but you need to make a sweeping attitudinal change. And in February 2014, the Constitutional Convention uh, voted in favour of an amendment to the Constitution to insert uh, the right, uh, economic, social and cultural rights, which would have meant that citizens could go to court and vindicate their rights, um, maybe in terms of receiving health care or housing. Now, we've had seven referendums since that proposal was made. We've had referendums of referendums on other issues that came out of the Constitutional right. Convention and the Citizens' Assembly. We've had uh, referendums, for instance, on judges' pay and Shannon reform. Not quite as pressing, I would have thought, and there hasn't been a, a squeak about the ESC rights. If we had that in the Constitution, we wouldn't need a specific uh, right to housing. So why, why is the Oireachtas not pushing for okay. something that the citizens recommended? Okay. Uh, I, I would suggest... Yeah. Uh, I would suggest when the politicians come around to your door, you ask them one, one question at least. Do you support the right to housing being inserted into the Constitution? Now the government are adamant they don't want that. If you read Rebuilding Ireland, Government Strategy on Housing and Homelessness, you will not see any reference to housing as a fundamental right. Yeah. Even though we have signed up to international treaties which affirm housing as a fundamental right, what you will read in Rebuilding Ireland is housing is a fundamental requirement. And that's different because rights have obligations, requirements don't. So get, if we could get that into the Constitution, then that puts a pressure on any government 
to give housing the priority which 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 it deserves. I think that's a very good question. Thank you. As a health minister, I don't yeah. have a difficulty if that's what people want, want to do. But I want to be quite clear, we've had this discussion a few times, and it's, it's, it's going through the dollar committee at the moment, whether you have this referendum or not. It genuinely won't help us deliver any more houses because we, we're under no, under no pressure as it is to trust me, I would get robbed every day of the week upper housing. So we don't need the right to housing. We, it won't change because we, it won't change that we're doing because we're doing all we can to get houses built as quickly as we possibly can. And it's, it's no problem, it's going to go through the system, people will vote on that, and if it becomes a right, that's great. But trust me, we're doing all we can anyway. We can put out that right to house. It's not needed for that to, to drive us on. If, I don't need if, that. If, don't if it's it. not going to make any difference, why not put it into the yeah. Constitution? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming today, and in particular, the panel, Father McFerry, Justine McCarthy, Janice Sullivan, and the Minister. You've certainly given us a lot to think about and talk about. And definitely the last word in this hasn't been said yet, so thanks very much.